just to set the record straight, I am not an executive director. I am a uh, president, president of Adat Yashurin, and prior to becoming president, I was treasurer of Adat Yashurin for five years. Uh, I stepped into the president's role about two and a half months ago. And um, I'm sure you've heard this before, but I'm going to say it again. You've all heard the joke about the newly elected shul president. No? Congregant comes up to a newly elected shul president and says, so, how's it been since you've been president? The president says, you know, it has been absolutely wonderful. In fact, since becoming president, I have sleep like a baby. Congregant says, surprised, really? You're sleeping like a baby? He said, oh yeah, since becoming president, I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours and cry. <laughs> Um, before I get started, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the OU, thank you to uh, Yehuda, uh, Rabbi Posey, who's not here, Rabbi Kalinsky for inviting me out to present today. And what I'm hoping to do today is just sort of give an overview of some of the steps that we at Adat Yashurin took as it regards to this concept of running your shul like a business. And quite frankly, this is a relatively new concept, particularly in, in the world of orthodox shuls. Um, you know, it used to be you'd sort of throw your budget up to Hashem and say, Hashem will take care of it, and that's the end of it. And of course, ultimately, Hashem will take care of it. But we as boards, we as, as executive directors, certainly have to do our part to make sure that our shuls are run like businesses and not like shtetls or shtebels, which of course is the way they used to be. Uh, so again, nothing that I'm going to say is written in stone. Uh, you might decide to use some of these. May, perhaps you're already using some of these techniques. But uh, again, my hope is to give you an overview of a few of the things that we've done at Adat Yashurin to make that transformation from purely running it like a shul to like a business. Um, so the first thing that we did I guess I should start perhaps by giving a little bit of history of where this line of thinking came about. So our congregation started about 25 years ago. Um, for you, those of you who don't know, it started by Rabbi Jeff Walgenlanter and his wife, and a handful of, of families. Uh, when they first started, there was no office, there was no building, there were no employees. They literally rented small office space um, in, a, in a storefront. And even the rabbi at the time was not an employee, he was 1099. So we had no real revenue, we had no real expenses, so we had no real need to run our organization like a business. And then 10 years ago, um, as the congregation began to grow, they decided to purchase land and build a building. And now for the first time in our history, we had real bills, we had real employees, we had a mortgage, that had to be paid on a monthly basis and on a timely basis. So the board at the time really sat down and said, okay, we need to do something to begin the process of having better cash management of our organization. So the first thing that they did was hired an outside auditor. Uh, I don't know if anybody has done this yet, but we brought the auditors in to evaluate um, our accounting method, our procedures, the controls, financial controls that we had adopted at the shul at the time. And we took our auditors literally through each and every aspect of our financial situation. They looked through the financial statements. They looked at our reporting mechanisms, our financial control mechanisms. And based on the advice of the auditors, we made one huge change at the time. Uh, we switched from an accrual basis of accounting to a cash basis of accounting. Um, and I know this seems to be a very hot topic. I am not a CPA, so I'm not going to get into you know, the benefits of, of which one is in fact better, but I will give you a couple of examples of why it was the right decision for us to make at the time. Um, first and foremost, again, per our auditors, um, they said to us that since shul pledges, which at the time was our, real, our only real source of income, were not enforceable claims, meaning a congregant legally does not have to pay their shul pledges, um, we should not have the, receivable, the, the receivables would not be counted under GAP standards. Um, so as a result of that, we decided to, one of the reasons we decided to switch to a cash basis. Also at the time, our shul budget was under $500,000, and most of that budget was made up of salaries. 
So again, it was the auditor's experience that the size of the organization um, dictated that accrual statements would be more confusing to the users um, and really would not offer any better business information. And therefore, again, one of the first steps that we took as we began the process of running the shoe like a business was to switch to a, to a cash basis. The second thing we did was we created a structured budgetary process. And most importantly, we stuck to that budgetary process. Um, we literally went through the budget, and this is one of the things that I helped do personally, we went through the budget line by line, and we took out all of the fluff from our budget. And perhaps, and you know how this goes, you know, you need an extra $10,000 to make your budget neutral for the year, so you add it to fundraising. And now all of a sudden, voila, you've got a neutral budget. Well, we did away with that fluff process, as you will. Um, and I remember the first year we went from a neutral budget, budget to a projected $100,000 deficit. Um, and this was based on the advice of the Finance Committee. The board at the time looked at me as my first year as treasurer and said, huh? Um, nonetheless, it was a very important step that we had to take to, to have real numbers, to have transparent numbers that um, we as a board could really believe in. And an interesting thing happened. As we went through our budget, we found there were many areas of the budget that we could make improvements, um, particularly on, on the expense side of our budget. And I'll just give you one very simple example. Uh, we used to send everything out of the office smail, snail mail, i.e. newsletters, bulletins, uh, kiddish sponsorships. Everything went out via snail mail. Well, we switched to having it sent out email, and it had an immediate effect to the positive on our expenses. We were able to shave about $7,000 out of the budget. So one of the things that we realized is, again, like businesses are going to look for different ways to cut costs, well, we as a shul needed to begin to look at different ways that we could cut costs. And even though things were done perhaps for 25 years one way, you know, again, we said we can no longer do this this way. Our budget and making our numbers work are more important. And we, because we were completely open with our congregants because we had conversations with the congregation. They bought into the fact that they wouldn't be getting things via mail. They'd open up their computer. And for those that didn't have a computer, fine. We, we still will make copies and they have the ability to come into the office. Um, as we switched to the income side and begin looking at our income sources, we really only had three. We had dues, we had our Yom Kippur appeal, and we had our spring fundraiser. That's it. I'm a big fan of focusing on our most controllable source of revenue, and those were our dues. So we took a survey of all of the synagogues in our area, both reform, conservative, and orthodox, to get an idea of what was our competition charging in the way of dues. And what we found is we were dramatically undercharging our congregants. Um, so again, my first year of treasurer, we raised dues 10%. <laughs> And we once again had a conversation with our congregants, and they had absolutely no pushback because we were open and transparent with them. Um, another thing that we did was we instituted a cost of living increase each and every year. Um, and our, our argument was quite simple. You go to the gas station, it costs you more today to fill up your car than it did two years ago, five years ago, ten, 10 years ago. Well, guess what? It costs us more to operate our shul today than it did five years, 10 years, and 20 years ago. And once again, I'm gonna harp on this a lot. Because we had open and transparent conversations with our congregants, we didn't get one that said, I'm not buying into that. So they all believed in this new idea of fiscal responsibility. They all believed in this new idea of, we're bigger, we have more congregants, we have to begin to change the way that we are running the shul. Um, Another thing that we did, and I should just add as a note, um, because of some of these cost of living increases and because of the fact we, do, we did raise dues, our dues revenue now makes up 45% of our income, whereas only five or six years ago it made up 33%. So now we know that virtually half of our income is projectable, uh, and that of course makes our daily cash management that much easier. 
We do, uh, not a lot. Now I will say that um, the question is, did as we were raising dues, were people financially unable to pay? Um, and the answer was, not really. We saw very little increase in those that came to us saying, you know what, we can't pay. Now I will say, and this is, I guess, the biggest difference between, at the end of the day, it's course as a shul versus a business. If a congregant comes to either myself as president or to the rabbi, and again, we don't have an executive director at the shul, um, the answer is always, what can you afford to pay? Plain and simple. Um, and that is a message, quite frankly, and that's a great question, that we did put out to our congregation as we were going through this process. Um, and then, of course, when the economic slowdown hit, we reiterated that message to our congregants. Um, and my hope is there is this feeling of, I understand that they need to run this like a business. However, if I'm having difficulty, they can come to us at any time, and we don't ever give pushback as far as what they can pay. How yeah. We're about 280 units, um, so, you know, on, on Yom Kippur, we might have six, 700 people there. Yes, Rabbi. That's true. I mean, we're certainly more insulated than perhaps the rest of the country, but, but we have our own challenges, of course. Um, one of those challenges being, you know, we don't have the donor pool that perhaps you have on the, on the East Coast. Um, but again, even those that were hit by the financial mm -hmm. downturn, you know, we were there, we were to support them, and we always put out this message again that, yes, we have to do things to make sure we meet our bottom line, but you're more important on an individual basis than our bottom line. Yes. Can you just put some, you, some hard numbers? You said you raised dues 10% and they're now 45% of your budget. Can you put that in context? Sure. Yeah, so our dues when I took over as treasurer are about 1,500 in round numbers. They're now just over $2,000. Um, so in the last five years, again, we've raised dues, you know, 30, 40%. Um, so that's it's another $100,000 a year. Now, one of the things also, as we are going to our congregants, explaining to them what we did, we didn't go to them after that first year and say, we are raising dues again. We called it a cost of living increase. Um, so in their minds, in the last five years, they've had one dues increase and four cost of living increases. And the cost of living increase is a much different story or a much different pitch to the congregants than a dues increase. Yes? So we did a couple of different things. Um, prior to us raising dues, we put feelers out into the community. And that was via letters. Um, that was via emails. That was via one-to-one -one congregation, one-to-one uh, -one, one -to -one conversations with members. Um, and then at the AGM, after we had sufficiently put out enough feelers in our mind, at our annual general meeting that year, that's when we told the congregation at large that we were in fact going to institute some of these measures that we had spoke about. And we thanked all of the congregants that had given us their feedback, which again gets them involved in the process and has them buy into it um, prior to us, you know, there was some, yeah, there was lobbying, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of having the membership take ownership of their membership, um, rather than just showing up on a Shabbos, having a schnapps at Kiddush, and then you don't see them again for a week. Um, you know, one of the things, as Rabbi Kalinsky knows, that I'm in the process of instituting are committees. Uh, many of you may have committees. We don't, so you have just a couple of people doing all of the heavy lifting, and I made the decision, um, one, because I have a job outside of the shul, that I couldn't do it all. So again, we formed committees. Each head then went into the congregation to build these committees, which incorporates more of the congregants into the process, which then, of course, gets them to buy into what we're doing. And if they don't buy into it, 
or we're going to find out pretty quickly, and that's when the board will then meet and say, hey, this is the feedback we're getting. Do we still want to proceed in that same direction, or do we want to make some changes? There is this notion that La Jolla is this unbelievably wealthy community, that money is no object, and in fact, that's not the case. Um, most of our contributions come from a very small handful of, yes, wealthy, wealthy individuals. Um, but you know, for years we've been wanting to, rate, to do a capital campaign. We've got a million dollar approximately mortgage on the building. We don't have the support financially from the congregation to raise a million bucks, which you know, in today's day and age is, is bupkis. So we are not this uber wealthy community that, oh, a million dollars, here's a check and let's move on. Um, part of the reason we went through this planning process is because we knew that it would, could be taxing on some of our members. Now, to your point as well, and this is sort of the second part, did we just say we are changing absolutely nothing yet and we're going to raise you know, tuition by 10% that first year? We did not. Um, so we came up with an enhanced programming, if you will, that I, my hope is in their minds justified the reason we were raising our dues. And the third point is, again, if you have a sit down with your congregation and you explain things to them in everyday terms, not a, a letter that says we have 100 members, each of you should be $2,500, because their, their pushback is going to be, well, I'm not one of those guys. I don't care. I'm not at shul five times a week learning dafiomi. I'm at Kiddush once a week, and that's the end of it. That's where that pushback comes in. So what we did was we embraced the community. We first looked at our community and said, wait a minute. We're making a shift within the community. The old guard, for lack of a better term, is starting to move away because their kids have now graduated. Their kids have moved back east. The new guard that's coming in are the younger people with the three kids at, in private school. So we couldn't pitch to the congregation, we have Dafiomi five days a week and that's why we're raising dues because they wouldn't have bought into it. However, because we have all this wonderful educational programming and then began to incorporate more social programming and this is what you're now going to get for this increase in dues, um, as I said, we got very little pushback. And then every year going forward, it became that cost of living increase. It wasn't another dues increase. And even for the most basic person, if you go into the supermarket and you know, hey, last year I spent, and I'll throw it out, you know, 75 cents for a head of lettuce. This year I'm spending 90 cents for a head of lettuce. Oh, there is some sort of cost of living increase. The shul is experiencing that same increase. If Ralph's, our local supermarket, is doing it, well, why can't the Dot Yashurin do it as well? And that's what they believed in. Um, now, again, we have to, you know, put some muscle behind that. We have to increase our programming. But by communicating to the congregants, by getting them to buy into what we were trying to accomplish, by letting them know the steps we are making today ensures that the shul will be here for your kids and, God willing, their kids, um, it becomes a very easy story to, to have your congregation embrace. So it's interesting, because San Diego is higher than the national average, we do about a 4.5% increase every single year. Um, we will. We can't. We can't. So we are near max. So again, when we did this survey of other synagogues in the area, we realized that under our current structure, 21, 2200 would be our max. Um, we do not have a building fund. So then what does the option become? Now we've maxed out at dues. Well, virtually every synagogue in our area has a building, a mandatory building maintenance fund. We do not. So we could institute a building maintenance fund. Do I think we'll get some pushback? Absolutely, and that's why we've not done it in the past. Um, we could say, okay, now we're going to do this million dollar capital campaign, burn our mortgage. That has an immediate impact on our budget where then we can leave dues flat and not have to raise them. And get rid of the mortgage and that saves us, I mean, we pay, you know, $70,000 a year. So that pays us $70,000 a year, if you will. Um, so, and I'm sort of skipping ahead, but this sort of planning is stuff that we're doing all the time at Adat Yashurin um, because we know that there are going to be limitations on, on how far. So to go into this process without an end game, 
Well, no business would certainly do that, and therefore we won't do that. You know, one of the challenges we face in La Jolla, which might be different for many of you, is it's very cost prohibitive to move into La Jolla. So our membership has not grown in the last seven or eight years. We're net neutral. Um, so we don't have the luxury of, let's say, doing a huge membership marketing campaign to try to bring in new members. So we, we just won't get them. Um, so the, this is sort of a, a curveball that we have that many of you might not have because you know people are moving to the East Coast all the time and trying to get involved. Yes. Um, it may be a bit premature to where you are, but uh, you, think, you started to think about what the messaging might look like if you're going to go to your membership and say, "Well, we're now going to go to the building fund." Like, so the answer is yes, very loosely. Um, there are a couple of issues that when you, I talk about pushback that we get constant pushback from. It's things like a building, uh, mandatory building fund. Um, you know, again, our community is interesting from the standpoint of when the building was built 10 years ago, you had this whole generation of congregants contribute to the building and make pledges. Then you have this whole new set of congregants that have been here, let's say, 10 years or less, that have made no contributions. Um, so the board is very split. You have those that have been here 10 years or more saying, let's get those young guys and get them to contribute. And I, I'm in that group, and I'm certainly open to that kind of idea. Um, and then you have the 10 years or more group that says, well, well, we gave already. I'm not going to give again. Um, so we do get some pushback. It's something that we're going to have to give a lot more thought to over the next, let's say, three or four years when we've really maxed out our dues. Um, my hope is by then the economy begins to improve and we do a capital campaign instead because I think, again, one of the surveys that we did was what would people stand behind? Would they stand behind, let's try to raise $5 million and buy a rabbinical house, burn the mortgage, uh, do all sorts of other things, or would they stand more behind a targeted campaign, solely a burn the mortgage campaign? And again, through this communication process, one of the things we found was the congregants are more willing to contribute to a targeted campaign than this, let's go raise a ton of money and do you know, all sorts of good things. So my feeling is we'll end up doing a, you know, raise a million dollars to burn the mortgage campaign, then take a step back, see how that affects our budget, and then move forward from there. We separated our operational, balance, our operational accounts from our capital accounts. Um, and now we have an operational checking, checkbook checking account and a capital right. checkbook checking account. And we can now very easily say, okay, wait a minute. This was money that was earmarked to our building maintenance fund. It gets deposited into the capital account. This is dues. This gets deposited into the operational account. And quite frankly, we did something similar at a dot about two years ago. We did a 10-year capital improvement budget. And our building maintenance committee uh, chair came to the board and said, hey, over the next 10 years, we're anticipating you're going to have to spend $200,000 maintaining the building. So it became a focus of the board to put away any operational surplus into then this capital account. And now we have funded that, that capital account to the tune of about $200,000. Our revenue really is three, three sources, dues, Yom Kippur appeals, and our spring fundraiser. That's it. We don't auction off Aliot on Simchas Torah um, because we're not looking to constantly go to our congregants. And quite frankly, when the congregation comes to us with a suggestion, we would love a speaker's program. You know what? So would we. How about you sponsor it? Great. And then we are able to incorporate that program. We get that person to, to own that program, if you will and to write a check. Our biggest challenge is, and we are fortunate to have a pocket of wealthy individuals, but they're not particularly involved to that level. We do have a couple of people that we can go, we've tried, we've tried. Um, you know, we have some interesting demographics within our shul, um, but we do have a couple of, of individuals that we can say, hey, we want to hire a youth rabbi. We're $20,000 short you've got your $20,000. But that's one out of 100. Um, that's one out of 100. You know, we don't have the person that can write a $200,000 check if that's what we need. If our air conditioning or roof gets blown off, we don't have the person that can write a $150,000 check. So we need to take that on ourselves. And how do we do that? By being transparent, by letting our congregation know perhaps more details than we should. So for two reasons, one, they again, 
buy into what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and two, because we don't ever have to worry about going to a donor and saying, we need this done, can you help us? And then what do they always say? Well, you guys can't manage your own budget, you can't run your own books, I'm not gonna help you out till you get your you know, financial house in order, and we don't have those sort of issues. Um, so very quickly, because I'm getting um, short on time here, uh, one of the other things that we did was we pre-plan, as I mentioned now, everything that we do. So if we want to bring in, uh, we want to hire a youth rabbi, for instance, well, we're not going to hire him until we know we have funding in place. Um, and again, some of this we learned the hard way. We put up an era of three to four years ago. Um, the president and treasurer at the time said it would cost us $50,000. It cost us $100,000, and we had absolutely no plan on how to pay for it. So we avoid those sort of issues now going forward. Uh, you, it seems commonsensical, but people just don't do that anymore, and now we do. Um, and then lastly, I'll touch on one more. Um, I mentioned we separated out our operational income and expenses. And then finally, and this is probably one of the most basic things, but perhaps a lot of schools don't do it, we formed a finance committee that looks at the budget each and every month. And if we see there are variances within the budget that we did not calculate, well, we are very quick to react to it and get creative if we have to. Um, but more importantly, we know within a 30-day time period if, okay, we are on track or, boy, we need to sit back, get together with the board and make recommendations to right the ship. Thank God it hasn't happened yet. Um, in fact, because of some of these very simple points that I've talked about today, we actually had surpluses throughout the entire economic downturn. Um, this year, we were able to hire a youth rabbi, which put additional pressure on, on our budget. But where did this need come from? The congregation. And our message to the congregation is we are here to serve you. However, if this is something that you want us to do, then we're going to need your help in accomplishing it. So by getting that communal commitment, you know, thank God we've been able to, um, to really keep our shul running like a business, staying fiscally strong. And I'm certainly confident that with some of these steps that we've talked about today, if you're not already doing that, you certainly can. That's it. Thank you.